let me begin by thanking our colleagues of Pro Forum for putting this together, and also the Center for Ethical Governance and Administration. Um, there are several occasions on which I have suggested to this government that it does help in certain times of difficulty to try to build a consensus on policy going forward. And I give the example that it worked for me at a time when we're facing strong headwinds in the economy. And uh, Seth and others, PV of being of blessed memory and others, came together and said, look, why don't we hold a national dialogue on the economy and bring everybody together so that we come out with a homegrown fiscal policy that all of us can have a buy into. And that led to the Senchi Forum, which was held at the Senchi Hotel. And uh, Seth P.V. Obing and several other people were key in bringing this together. And it led to the homegrown fiscal policy, which we eventually, when we went into the IMF, presented as our policy document. And it was adopted hook, line, and sinker. Nothing was added to it. <laughs> and it was on that platform that the economic turnaround began to, to occur. I suggested it several times, but it doesn't look like that is the, should I take it out? Well, some people say they can't see my face, so. <laughs> Since all of you are in mask, I can take mine off. <laughs> and feel protected. And so it led to the homegrown fiscal policy that led to the economic uh, turnaround and um, the fiscal consolidation that we began to achieve before we handed over in 2016. In the absence of a national dialogue like that, platforms like this are important to give the other perspective. You know, government has access to all the tools of communication and so monetary policy committee report, so, 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 so report, the finance minister comes to parliament, gives a media review and all that. But you need platforms that will give other perspectives to what government's hymn sheet is. And I think that that is what we have attempted uh, today. For those of you who are not students of economics, you must have found the tables and things a bit boring. But we actually came here to the University of Ghana Business School, to the city conference room to give you know the students here you know an opportunity to look at what the other side was and I think that uh, Seth has given a good technical uh, perspective <laughs> I am not an economic expert and so my presentation would deal more with bread and butter issues <laughs> As a politician, I'm not going to go into tables and others, but I will say it as I believe it is. And so good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Let me begin by thanking Mr. Seth Tekpe for his comprehensive delivery, which has brought home a number of key issues surrounding our recent economic trajectory. I do not intend to belabor the points he has made, except to reinforce a few of them. I'm a historian at heart, and so I like to look at these things from a historical perspective in order to give context to what we are witnessing today. Much has been made of the impact of COVID-19 on the Ghanaian economy. The truth, however, is that our economic history has, over the last few decades, been characterized by booms and busts, dictated by both domestic and external factors. For those of you who, are, um, who have looked historically at the Ghanaian economy, we have periods where we have booms, and then we have periods where we have uh, busts. Most of these busts are created by either external economic shocks or some prevailing conditions uh, within. Since the days of President Jerry John Rawlings, and even before then, these shocks have cyclically derailed incremental progress made over the years. The older generation, for those of you who are my age and around there, 
would recall how bushfires and droughts in the early 80s plunged the Ghanaian economy into crisis, leading to a very lengthy period of negative growth and very high inflation. By date of hard work and skillful management, the then PNDC government managed to salvage the economy and brought back sustained positive economic growth. For those of you who remember the economic recovery program, the structural adjustment programs, and all the acronyms that came with them. And when some people fell through the social safety nets and we needed to find social interventions to support them, we came up with the PAMS card, Program of Action to Mitigate the Social Cost of Adjustment. For those of you who are my age, you remember all those things. <laughs> and so it brought back positive economic growth until this was again undermined in the early 90s by falling commodity prices, which led to dwindling export revenues in the 90s. Um, when the Kufa administration took over, we went into the highly indebted poor country initiative, HIPEC, for those of you who remember. In order to secure debt relief, up to $3.8 billion of our debt was written off. And this offered significant fiscal space for us to begin the process of development again. At this period, too, there was a transition in the structure of the economy from one, it started in Kufo's era and it crystallized in Professor Mill's era because I remember in 2010, that was the year when services overtook agriculture as the biggest contributor to the Ghanaian economy's GDP. But the process started in President Kufo's time. Services began to grow uh, at an astronomical rate and by 2010, they overtook agriculture. And so it changed the structure of our economy. In the latter years of the President Ajikum Kufo administration, we discovered oil in commercial quantities and we joined the League of Oil Producing Countries. A global financial crisis reared its head around this time, and this also impacted our economy negatively. Then in came the Mills administration, under which I had the privilege of serving as Vice President and Head of the Economic Management Team. We in turn inherited a large budget deficit and huge arrears, as well as a depreciating currency. The effects of the single spine pay salary also impacted uh, revenues. Many people tend to overlook the fact that it was during this era that Ghana also recorded its most prosperous period of economic management. We had the highest levels of economic growth before oil production kicked in. For instance, in 2010, we grew at 8% without oil, non-oil growth. We didn't have oil, we grew at 8%. And then, at 14.4% in 2011 with oil. By this time, we had become an oil producer. That was the first year of oil production, which happens to be the highest growth Ghana has experienced in history. <laughs> but let me say that non-oil growth for 2011, that is without oil, was 8.4%. Oil topped up to make the 14.4%. <laughs> And the following year, 2012, we grew at 9.3%. We also achieved the longest sustained period of single digit inflation of 33 months, among several other important milestones. The cyclical shocks came back with a vengeance between 2013 and 2016. These included problems with power production, for those of you who remember, when unreliable gas supplies and frequent breakdown of power generation equipment resulted in a protracted power crisis that severely affected our economy. This was compounded by huge revenue shortfalls in the oil sector because of the lower than expected production from our only oil field at the time. At the time, we had only the Jubilee field, even though at this time we were working on ENI Sankofa and the 10 field. There was a problem with the turret of the FPSO, uh, Kwame Nkrumah, if you remember, and so they had to make some adjustments and reduce production to keep it going. So instead of 120,000 barrels, we're producing about 70,000 uh, barrels. And uh, that affected uh, oil revenues. So all these were shocks again that came after booms. So we have booms and busts, booms and busts. 
When confronted with these challenges, we put in real efforts to address them comprehensively and laid down critical structures that today have become some of the most important pillars supporting the Ghanaian economy. And um, Seth gave you the example of the uh, Energy Sector Levy Act, which has become one of the most important uh, domestic revenue pillars that we have. When we inherited the oil economy in 2009, we put in place the necessary mechanisms and institutional arrangements to ensure that Ghana derives the maximum benefit. We passed the uh, uh, PRMA, um, which is the uh, Public Revenue Management Act, under which we set up the Stabilization and Heritage Funds with about $500 million in them at the time we left power in 2017. We tackled the power crisis head on, and by the time we left office in January 2017, we had more than sufficient generation capacity to withstand any shocks in the energy sector. And above all, we brought stability to the energy sector and reliability in fuel supply for power generation when we built the Tuabo gas plants to process our own natural gas. And as I said, we set up the Energy Sector Levy Act, which by 2024 should have yielded up to about 40 billion uh, Ghana CDs. This stands us in good stead to overcome the stifling legacy debt in the energy sector and help address the liquidity challenges in that area. We set up the Ghana Infrastructure Investment Fund, GIF, to mobilize capital to undertake major infrastructural projects. And one of its first success stories, many people don't know this, is that GIF was included in the structuring of the financing of Terminal 3 at the Kotoka International Airport. We also established the Ghana Exim Bank to promote trade and commerce and industry within the Ghanaian economy. We set up the Sinking Fund, which is a mechanism through which we would set aside funds to retire maturing debt. And as of 2016, we had saved up to 550 million to pay off the first sovereign bond, which was floated under President Kofo. If you remember, the first euro bond was due, and we had saved up up to 550 million. Um, we did it, of course, hoping that we will win the 2016 election. But of course, we did it for Ghana, because when this new government came, but for the fact that we set aside that money, they would have very serious problems paying off that bond. We also had the contingency fund from which money was found recently to underwrite the relief efforts in the aftermath of the third uh, June disaster. No, we set it up after our experience with the third June disaster. We did all of these alongside massive investments in capital projects with a view to accelerating our economic development. We ensured that we kept our public debt within manageable le levels with debt amounting to 56% of GDP based on the rebased economic figures. This government likes to quote the debt to GDP in our time at the old GDP figures. And then they do an adjustment uh, with, in, in this time with the current debt to show that uh, the debt level is better than it was under our, our period. But I mean, that is disingenuous. If you rebase the economy, then same must match with same. You can't compare apples with oranges. We also brought down the rate of accumulation of debt, as has been vividly demonstrated uh, by the former finance minister in his presentation. It became necessary in 2014 for us to go into partnership with the IMF in order to achieve more success implementing our homegrown fiscal consolidation policies that we had crafted as a response to the economic turbulence resulting from the shocks that we I have spoken about earlier. Now, when we went to the IMF, this was the 16th time that Ghana was seeking assistance from the IMF as a nation. Though our opponents at the time made it sound as though it was novel and it was anathema, I made a point then that it was to be our last resort to the IMF because I was confident that Having the program straddle three years, though we had just two years left in office, 
it was going to ensure that a succeeding government would have the opportunity to continue from where we left off and do things that would make subsequent programs completely unnecessary. It is noteworthy that the program was extended by another year by the Akufado administration, and they received in excess of $300 million, which was the final tranche of the extended credit facility that came with the program. If you remember, the facility was a little over $900 million. And so by the time we left office, some 600 and something million had been disbursed. And so the new administration got the balance of the 300 and something million. I'm on record to have predicted in November 2016 that due to the work we had done to overcome the economic headwinds and the coming on stream of two additional oil fields, Sankofa and Tenfield, economic growth was going to exceed 7% in 2017 and beyond. I said this during the uh, State of the Nation address, I predicted. And this was confirmed by the World Bank and IMF, which predicted that growth was going to exceed 8% in 2017 and beyond. Additional oil revenue, a resolved energy crisis, paving way for more and sustained generation of power and sound implementation of our homegrown policies we're going to make life more comfortable for the new government that inherited after 2017. Despite these favorable conditions, most of the gains we made and bequeathed to this new government have been eroded and we've been plunged again into economic crisis. COVID-19 has become the convenient shipping boy and has been cited as the reason for the crisis we face now and the attended economic, uh, attendant economic hardship. Yes, COVID-19 affected the economy, and no one can dispute that. It is, however, not the main reason why we're in the current hole we find ourselves. COVID-19 only became a pretext for reckless election-related expenditure, which produced the largest ever budget deficit in recent economic history of Ghana last year. Indeed, you would remember that at a time when the new government had just taken over a year or two after, when things, uh, they were still enjoying the largesse that we had left them, um, the, the, one of the leading members of the government said that their reserves had grown so big that if any external shock affected Ghana, Ghana would be able to go three months without any seeking any external assistance. I don't know how many of you remember that statement. When COVID hit, it didn't take two weeks for the Ghanaian economy to go on its knees. And but for the IMF intervention, I mean, this economy would have collapsed completely. And so, so much about the resilience of the economy. Our debt has ballooned to unsustainable levels topping 80% of GDP and exposing us to very high risk of debt default. Almost all of our tax revenues is used to service our debt and interest rate, and the effect has been the introduction of several new taxes. Indeed, I think I heard said say that if you take total revenue, not total tax revenue, total revenue, it covers just compensation that is wages and salaries and compensation and interest payments. And so everything else, goods and services, capital expenditure, we have to borrow to be able to do. That's the reality of the economy today. And that is why we are on a borrowing spree. And it's a spiral that cannot be sustained. You cannot borrow more than, continue borrowing more than you earn. And so we'll, we'll see how that ends up. But this is the reality we're facing today. Almost all our tax revenues is used to service our debts, and the effect has been the introduction of several new taxes. You all know the COVID uh, tax. Um, during the elections, we enjoyed sweet, uh, uh, free water, free power, and at the time, several people warned us that we, somebody will have to pay for it anyway. Uh, immediately after the elections, uh, when the COVID taxes were brought and we complained, you know, 
we were told that, well, it was, it was not free to the generators, and so somebody has to pay those who generate the power, and that's why we are being subjected to these new taxes. So this has led to rampant increments in the prices of goods and services, and this is primarily responsible for the hardship that Ghanaians are going through today. A comprising with our neighbors and peers in sub-Saharan Africa, all of whom were also affected by COVID-19, shows that they have been able to protect their citizens from COVID-19 in ways that are similar to ours. They have, however, avoided increasing their debts and deficits because of more prudent management of their economies. And so if you make a comparison of our economy and our neighbors, you find that our economy has been more affected in terms of debt, in terms of deficit, than our neighbors have. And what can account for that? And that is even if you take the statistics at face value, I have accused this finance minister of creative accounting. And now you cannot trust government figures. And before we left it to academia and um, research think tanks to interrogate the figures and help us come with a reality of what the economic situation currently is. As he was talking, he mentioned that in many of the budgets, the bailout costs were left as footnotes. The energy sector debt was left as footnotes. And they were not captured as part of the deficit in order to give a better deficit figure. But if you added those liabilities, and there are liabilities that are government liabilities. They are nobody else's liabilities. And so if you are budgeting, you must take cognizance of them. But in order that we can give a better picture so that when we go on the bond market to borrow, we can uh, uh, get a more favorable borrowing uh, condition, we leave those figures out. And that has become a major problem. This government must accept that it is their mismanagement, mismanagement of the economy, their thirst for consumption expenditure, and the desire to spend beyond their means in order to win elections that have plunged us into the current crisis, not necessarily COVID-19. COVID-19 has exacerbated it. And as COVID normally does, it takes advantage of underlying pre-existing conditions. And so, <laughs> so COVID has taken advantage of the underlying conditions of the economy to make things even worse for us. And so can our economy is in ICU, and we all must pray hard that we are able to uh, survive as a nation. This government has been the luckiest government under the Fourth Republic. They benefited from 60% of all the oil revenues accruing to Ghana since we began producing oil. Since we began producing oil, if you take all the oil revenues we have earned 100%. This government alone in five years, four and a half years, has gotten 60% of all those oil revenues. They have had more than twice the total tax revenue available to us. If you take taxes as a whole, they have had 100% more in terms of tax revenues than any of the previous governments before. And they've enjoyed unprecedented support from our development partners, that's the IMF, the World Bank, and all the other uh, partners. Within a space of 12 months, this government has received up to 11 billion Ghana cities from the IMF alone, and have received over $200 million from the World Bank and other donors. They've had access to over $200 million from the stabilization fund that we set up. And they got the central bank to finance them uh, to a tune of 10 billion Ghana CDs. And the comparative with the central bank financing is that in 2016, the budget of Ghana was run the whole of 2016 without one single CD from the central bank. In 2016, we did zero central bank funding. This government has received 10 billion CDs from the central bank. 
They've also increased our debt by almost twice the total amount of all previous governments put together. And all of this notwithstanding, they have the least to show in terms of tangible gains or capital investments. It's all gone into consumption. Recently, I, I, I noticed a tweet. The good thing about social media is you should be very careful what you tweet or say because it will come back years later to haunt you. I saw a relative of the president in 2016 had calculated how much I had added to the public debt. And he came to some 28 billion or something like that. And then he divided it by 30 million Ghanaians and said that I have caused every Ghanaian to owe 1,700 Ghana CDs. I don't know who, how many of you saw it. Just two days ago. So I took my pen and I did the same calculation. <laughs> and his cousin, the president, has added 7,000 Ghana CDs debt to every Ghanaian. <laughs> and so, I mean, it just shows you, you know, what, what you do when you do that kind of comparison. And so, just in four years, Ghanaians, you know, uh, have had uh, 7,000 Ghana CDs added. To put it in proper context even, by the time I left office, if you added the total public debt, then from Nkrumah to I left office, we had lumbered Ghanaians with a debt per capita of 4,000 Ghana CDs. And then in four and a half years, his cousin has added 7,000 Ghana CDs to the 4,000. That puts it in even better perspective uh, for you. So these are some of the things that we need to look at. Another major problem has been the unprecedented levels of corruption and total lack of accountability and prudence in the management of the public purse. According to the Auditor General, financial irregularities within the public sector shot up from 700 million Ghana cities in 2016 to 12 billion cities in 2020. Procurement infractions have become a major issue. Sole sourcing of everything has become the order of the day. And procurement, yeah, I was going to, I, I was making this point. I remember, and Seth, you helped me here. As part of GIFMIS, we had a contract management and procurement, you know, module as part of GIFMIS. I don't know what has happened to that model. Is it still active? It's been deactivated. It was meant to bring more transparency into procurement and contract management. And that was a very important aspect of GIFMIS that we had started to implement. Now, I don't think that that module works. You know, everything has been uh, 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 abandoned. This level of leakage will definitely affect the ability of any government to deliver on its mandate and guarantee the citizens an appreciable standard of living. The nonchalance and total unwillingness to address corruption in government is a major worry and will continue to affect our economic fortunes until the trend stops. When I called for a change in government in 2024, when I said the eight years has to happen in order that the government can be held accountable and that people don't walk away with their stolen monies because it's obvious that this president has no will to tackle corruption. Anytime you attack him, they go back and go and resurrect cases from 2016. And I, I said before, I said the easiest, you know, uh, uh, way of fighting corruption is to prosecute your uh, political opponents. The true test of somebody who is willing to fight corruption is to investigate and prosecute your own. But it's clear that this president has no intention of investigating or prosecuting his own. And that's why the natural order of things that Ghanaians have established is after eight years, leave and let a new government come and hold you accountable.
And so when I called for a change in government in 2024, as a first step towards halting this hem hemorrhage of badly needed resources through corruption and holding offending officials to account, our friends in government took offense. But it remains the only viable way to save and protect the public purse in the face of abundant evidence that nothing will be done by this president about the situation. Today we've heard a lot of numbers and these numbers tell a story. We politicians like to recite numbers with aplomb, believing that they show our superior performance. Our people have often questioned the relevance and importance of these numbers by retorting that they do not reflect in their lives or their pockets. Anytime we talk about GDP growth and inflation going down and things, our people say, well, what's the purpose of all these figures when, I mean, life is still so bad for us? They are justified in demanding a correlation between the numbers that we boast about and improvements in their lives. To what extent have we been able to offer a tangible linkage between our talk about stable inflation and our people actually going to the market and finding that prices have remained the same over an extended period of time? No, prices have not remained the same over an extended period of time. Our people are just galled by the hypocrisy of so-called economic experts who in 2016 Ask them to forget about economic statistics and look at the escalation of prices of cement and other products on the market. And then today, the same experts in government hold up statistics, including inflation, and say that life is better now for them and that the perception of hardship in Ghana is just a creation of Mahama. And yet when you go on the market, every day you see prices are changing. And they say, no, forget about that. Look at the statistics. Inflation is a single digit, you know. And yet the same people in the past said, forget about inflation being single digit. The reality is look at how prices are changing on the market. I mean, this is the kind of hypocrisy that I say is laughable. And there's so many examples of them. When they point about forex relation, forex uh, rate relation with fundamentals, and then when the same forex thing happens, they say it doesn't necessarily mean that the fundamentals are weak. <laughs> this is a conundrum for us all. And the question I ask is, how have we all ensured as leaders that when we have touted high economic numbers, it has found expression in the number of jobs that are created within the economy to guarantee our teeming youth a dignified existence within which they are able to meet their needs and those of their dependents? How has economic growth led to actual growth in the lives of our people? So it's not how fast the economy is growing, it is how that growth, you know, is devolved into reflecting in the lives of, of our people. You can have countries with lower growth, but you find that development and growth of their people is, is much better. And so it's not just about touting high GDP growth. It is what, uh, how it reflects on our people. We're at a juncture where these questions have become even more critical. Despondency, disillusionment and, disillusionment and frustration over unmet expectations and our collective inability over the years to translate economic numbers into tangible outcomes and improvements in the living conditions of our people are casting an ominous pall over the enthusiasm that greeted the democratic transition that took place decades ago. Our people are beginning to question whether this whole democratic effort is not only a ruse to guarantee access to the resources of a country to a privileged few elite, to do as they please with it and satisfy their creature comforts to the detriment of the masses who should be the ultimate beneficiaries. The much heralded democratic dividend is fast turning into a mirage far beyond the reach of the people for whom it was intended. 
there can be no denial of the fact that Ghana is caught in the throes of deep social and economic problems. Mountain unemployment, affecting millions of our young people, ever declining quality of education, problems with our health care and agriculture, decaying infrastructure, corruption, weakening and politicization of state institutions, insecurity, unreliable public services continue to make life very difficult for the average Ghanaian. The speed with which hundreds of thousands of young people spontaneously took over social media and demanded that this country be fixed is a cautionary tale on how exactly the people feel about the way this country is being governed. Rather than cynically scoffing at these calls and ascribing political motives to them and pretending that the genuine cry for help from our citizens is a figment of the imagination of some political leaders, we should be lending a listening ear to these young people and indeed to our people. The problems of our country and the solutions to them cannot be reduced to a handful of fancy slogans. And so when elections are coming, it's free SHS. Next election, Agenda 111. Our problems go beyond this slogan sloganeering. We have problems in every sphere. And so when the young people say fix the country, they're not talking about sloganeering and a partial fix in one segment or an attempt to fix one segment. It's about looking at the lives of Ghanaians comprehensively and making their lives more meaningful. So the problems facing our country and the solutions to them cannot be reduced to a handful of fancy slogans and poorly conceived and implemented half measures aimed at obtaining short-lived political gratification only to have them inflict deeper socioeconomic wounds on our country and leave more problems than they resolve. Government is not about empty sloganeering and PR stunts. It should be about methodical steps that are well conceived and thought through to address our problems holistically and permanently. And it should be about carrying the bulk of our people along with the policies and programs that we, should, we come up with. It should be about crafting and rolling out a vision that transforms society in meaningful ways which will clearly benefit all our people and not just a few.